Hello. <clears throat> I hope that you guys are doing well, having a great day. My computer's being slow as always. Hopefully you can see the presentation. My screen is blank right now. Okay. <laughs> All right, today, so we're going to talk about amputations, about prosthetics, and about orthotics. <clears throat> With amputations, this is the surgical removal removal of a limb or a portion of a limb. Um, legs are more common than arms, and peripheral vascular disease is the most common reason that someone has to have a portion of a limb amputated. Peripheral vascular disease, so not enough blood flow getting to that area, inadequate blood flow. Things we're going to talk about in this lecture, we'll talk about types of amputations, compression garments, and then different treatment considerations. We're going to start with the upper extremity. So with the upper extremity, you can have a shoulder disarticulation, <clears throat> also a four quarter amputation, um, <clears throat> transhumoral amputation, elbow disarticulation, trans tip radial um, amputation, and then wrist disarticulation or partial hand. So any of those can be performed, and now we're going to talk about each one. With a shoulder disarticulation, it looks like he actually had the one before that, the four-quarter amputation, um, and she had the shoulder disarticulation. Um, there is a possibility of using a functional prosthetic device, um, but typically the shoulder, it requires an external shoulder joint. So sometimes that joint will have to be further out because you've removed part of the joint, now you're adding a new joint in, and um, <clears throat> may change the mechanics of the arm movements, but typically there is a possibility of using that prosthesis functionally with this type of amputation. Um, wound healing. Um, hold on. I guess I got my slides out of orders. Yes. Sorry, my slides are kind of out of order, but um, we'll talk about wound healing and then we'll go through the rest of the arm amputation. Sorry about that. Wound, wound healing is the key to um, to as key for amputees. So sometimes the reason that they're getting an amputation is because there was some type of sore that didn't heal. So now once they cut um, down to kind of the good viable tissue, that's a new wound and it could also have problems healing. So um, it's key to make sure that the wound is healing correctly. If it fails to heal, they may need to revise the amputation and cut up higher, which is not what you want. Um, some of the things that we look at when we're looking at a wound is to see whether it's healing or not. We look for sloth. Sloth, that sloth is stringy yellow moist necrotic tissue. Then eschar. Eschar is the black dry tissue. Sometimes it's covering the whole wound and if it is, you typically remove that so that you can get down to the viable tissue. Uh, Silvadine is an antimicrobial. It's used in wounds. It helps prevent infection. Elase is an uh, enzymatic ointment you put on wounds to help debride the wounds. Um, typically with PTs, I just want you basically to know um, to have like a common <laughs> minor knowledge of kind of some of these words and what it means to see what they're looking at. But typically if a PT is working in wound care, um, that's like their primary thing. It's not just you see a random wound that you've never seen before. They typically will go to a wound specialist that really only sees wound patients. So um, you may or may never actually see a wound that you're treating itself. But if you're treating someone who has amputation, you may also see their wound, uh, even if you're not the one treating it. I hope that makes sense. Um, there's three stages of wound healing, or three types. There's primary intention. Um, these are the types of wound healing. So with this, this is like where you can get sutures or steri-strip. The um, tissue is close enough together that you can bring it 
uh, and reapproximate the edges. So bring them back together and then close the area with sutures or with strips and to facilitate re-epithelialization. So basically you grab both parts of the wound, you pull them together, you keep them together with either sutures or stereo strips, staples, and the wound heals. Um, so typically that would have to be with minimal tissue loss. All the tissues there, it's just kind of a straight cut. Um, this would be common with surgeries, with um, cut wounds, and with puncture wounds. Secondary in intention is when the um, enough tissue is lost that you cannot bring the edges of the skin together. There's an area that you cannot. So if you look at this thumb, there's a portion where there are stitches where they were able to bring um, the skin together, and then there's a portion where the skin is just open. That is secondary intention where enough of the tissue is lost or if the borders are irregular or if there's parts that are dying um, that you cannot close it with um, um, sutures, stitches is the common word. Um, word finding is just <laughs> not there these days. Um, typically they leave this type of wound open and they put special dressings on it to make sure it's healing and they continue to watch and look after it and care for the wound to make sure that it's healing appropriately. That is secondary intention. With tertiary, tertiary, um, they leave the wound open for a while and then close it. So typically it's when the person is likely to get an infection and they want to leave it open to make sure the infection comes out and doesn't get closed inside. Um, that would create an even worse wound over time. And after a certain amount of time, when they feel like they're good to go, then they will close it with stitches. So in these pictures, the top is that primary intention. It's like a cut. They pull the skin back together and they sew it up and then it heals. With the secondary, there's kind of a deep, like a full thickness type wound, um, and they leave it open and just keep caring for the wound. Eventually, it closes over the top, and uh, later, the bottom portion heals as well. With the tertiary, it is an open wound. They leave it open for some time, and then once they are confident that um, there's good viable tissue and not infection, then they can shut it with some stitches. Um, there still needs to be minimal tissue loss so that they can bring the edges of the skin together and sew them back together. Um, I think that's all that we really need to know. So and examples are with some type of infection or with a dehiscence where a wound has just busted open which typically happens when there's an infection or significant amount of swelling. All right, so back to the arm amputation. Sorry for the mix up with my slides, but um, transhumoral. Uh, so typically they leave at least seven to 10 centimeters, um, have above the proximal to the distal humeral condyle. So above the elbow. So at least seven to 10 centimeters above the elbow. Um, if they had a fracture, if they had peripheral nerve injury, if they had a dislocation, um, then they will have to wait until all that heals and is resolved before they can start using a prosthesis. So that could delay their use of a prosthesis. Um, with with transhumoral amputations, there is some functional use of prosthesis. With an elbow disarticulation, then they cut right at the elbow joint. So the bottom of the humerus is all intact, but they remove <clears throat> the radius and ulna. Um, it allows for a self-suspending socket. It's held on with an anchor. So typically the anchor will go up past um, the um, shoulder joint and then the external prosthetic elbow is going to be lower than where the actual elbow would have been. Um, and typically there is an external prosthetic elbow that is required for functional use. So that is the elbow disarticulation. 
transradial. Um, it, the transradial, in order to be considered transradial, it must be at least five centimeters above the wrist, above the distal radius. Um, with it's similar with uh, transhumoral, where if there is a fracture or peripheral nerve injury or dislocation, then it would slow or delay the use of a um, prosthetic device but it is preferred over some more distal amputation. So typically, in most cases with the amputations, they spare as much as possible. So they leave, they only take like the dead tissue, the area that's not healing. They try and leave as much as possible. But with this instance, sometimes this transradial amputation is preferred over a lower one because it can be more functional with a prosthetic device. With a wrist disarticulation, they leave some of the carpal bones and remove the whole hand. Um, the radius and the ulna are fully intact. And um, it's not performed very often because cosmetically, it typically does not have the greatest appearance and it doesn't have a lot of function. It has a disadvantage as far as function. So, it's rarely performed, but there are occasions you'll see a wrist disarticulation. With a partial hand, typically if they're able to get any sort of functional grip with the hand, like a pinch with the hand, then they will spare as much of the fingers as they can to keep some type of a grip. Um, they can produce perform a procedure where they take a toe and um, sew it on the hand to have some functional use like a thumb um, and that may or may not be indicated depending on the patient's situation. Now on to leg amputation. So hemipelvectomy is part of the pelvis itself is removed, hip disarticulation, transfemoral disarticulate or transfemoral amputation knee disarticulation, transtibial or below knee amputation, and then foot amputations. There's quite a few of those. Uh, Symes, Chopart, transmetatarsal, Liz Frank, there's quite a few different types of foot amputations. With the hemipelvectomy, it doesn't allow for activation of a prosthetic device, so they can wear the device, but the only thing that allows it to bend and straighten is weight bearing. Um, so the muscles and all the um, portions of the limb that remain are not actually causing uh, or um, activating in order to activate the prosthetic device. With a hip disarticulation, they leave the full pelvis and they take the femur down. They take the whole femur, so right in the middle of the hip joint. Um, it has the same considerations as a hemipelvectomy, so no real advantage or disadvantage to that. It's just based on what uh, the patient is experiencing and what they really need. With a transfemoral amputation, um, the patient is susceptible to hip flexion contractures. So um, you have to be really careful about stretching out their hip flexors, about working on strengthening hip extensors, even in this picture. This guy with the longer limb, residual limb, um, looks like he has some really good extension. It's just hanging down, even with the other leg. But the guy with the shorter limb, it looks like he's in a little bit of hip flexion. And um, it's really easy to get a hip flexion contracture, harder to get rid of it, but it also affects your gait and your ability to use the prosthetic device. So you have to be really careful to avoid that. Um, with a transfemoral, the patient has to adapt in order to maintain their balance. Um, they have to adapt to the weight of the prosthetic, and they are going to require more energy to do the same types of um, activities. Um, you, with a transfemoral, you are not able to weight bear through the distal portion of the residual limb. So how they would weight bear is throughout the entire surface of the residual limb. Sometimes they'll have devices that weight bear up higher, like in a circumduction, like holding the limb like that, but up higher, rather than um, 
weight bearing through the bottom so it would hold the limb up top and this part wouldn't have a lot of pressure on it um, or most of them will kind of cup the whole area and weight bear through the whole area but you cannot weight bear strictly through the end of the residual limb with the transfemoral amputation. With a knee disarticulation you are able to weight bear through the end of the limb. The only problem is that um, when you have a prosthetic knee and lower leg, the knee, is, knee joint itself is going to be lower than your original knee joint because you have the entire femur there and then below that will be the knee joint. And so it will kind of change the way they walk and cause some gait deviations. Um, and of course they are also susceptible to hip flexion contractures. So making sure that the patient is stretching and doing various positions, not just like sitting, uh, is key in avoiding that. With the transtibial, um, something I didn't mention, but the transfemoral used to be called an above knee amputation or AKA. Transtibial used to be called below knee amputation or BKA, but now they go more with the medical term, so transtibial. You are not able to weight bear through the residual limb again, um, not the distal portion. So rather than something being right on the bottom of it, something is going to be kind of encapsulating the entire remaining portion of the limb. And weight bearing is also through the patellar tendon. Um, and they are still susceptible for knee flexion contracture. So with all these patients, we really need to watch that and uh, they will require some adaptation in order to balance and to get used to how they need to move and walk with the new prosthetic device. With SIMES, this is through the ankle joint itself, so you are able to weight bear through. So basically when the entire, uh, when an entire bone is left, you're able to weight bear through it, but when you're cutting through a bone, in the middle of it somewhere, you're not able to weight bear through it. Um, but the end of the residual limb, the way that it bulbs out is typically not cosmetically preferred. So it's not always the patient's number one choice. Um, sometimes they will remove the malleoli in order to make it a more smooth curve and less um, rigid and so that the prosthesis can fit better because otherwise you have to go over something big to something smaller so it can't fit evenly across the limb. So sometimes they will have to do that and then adaptation is required um, due to the added weight of the prosthesis and decrease of towing off during gait. So with any type of prosthetic device your gait is going to be affected. With chill parts, here is where Symes is cut, right at the ankle joint. Um, with chill parts, it is here through the tarsals, Liz Frank through the metatarsals, transmetatarsal through the metatarsal. <laughs> um, so with the chill parts, it's a metatarsal amputation of the whole forefoot. The whole forefoot is gone. Um, typically, they will have uh, equinus deformity, so like kind of pointing down into plantar flexion, and the patient loses forefoot leverage. It's very difficult to balance. Um, they have very little weight bearing surface of the foot, and their proprioception is really damaged. So, um, you know, be aware of that with balance training and things with someone who's had this type of amputation. With transmetatarsal, they cut through the um, metatarsal, so the bones that go to your toes. Most of the time they make an incision on the bones, but they leave extra skin and tissue muscle around it and then kind of create a flap and sew it back together so that there's some cushion at the end of the bone. And that's kind of with all amputations, not just this transmetatarsal. Um, and this one's also called Liz Frank, depending on where exactly they cut. Um, and it has the same considerations of chill part. Still poor balance, still poor proprioception, still um, difficulty weight bearing th through that surface. 
with pressure garments. I have a whole lecture that I have uploaded on Blackboard. Um, that was a guest lecture from Hanger that uh, talks about care, amp amputee care after an amputation and pressure garments and how to wrap a residual limb and all that. So please take a look at that before class and we'll practice wrapping the limb and some of those types of things in lab. With treatment, some of the considerations, so we typically will do some type of residual limb wrapping to keep the inflammation out um, and any other type of modality or manual technique to help with edema control. Uh, positioning to encourage uh, stretching of muscles and decrease the likelihood of getting a hip flexor contracture. Range of motion and stretching exercises, bed mobility and transfers, ambulation, strengthening, balance, functional mobility. So uh, teaching them how to move and uh, walk and stand and balance again with the changes that have occurred at either their arm, leg, with us, typically we'll see more legs than anything. A lot of the arms will go to an OT. And wrapping guidelines. So avoid wrinkles in your wrap material. That can create extra pressure in areas and start to break that skin down. Use diagonal or angular patterns. If you look really closely at the picture, you can see the diagonal pattern this way. And from this side, it's going this way. Um, so it's not just straight across, it's diagonal because then that helps you uh, get the resistance um, and the amount of pressure kind of more consistent. Um, provide increased pressure distally than proximally. So if you had a lot of pressure up top, less pressure at the bottom, then it would push the inflammation down. And that's not what you want. You want to push the inflammation up. So more pressure at the bottom than the top. Anchor the wrap above the proximal joint. So if you were wrapping um, a transtibial amputation, you would anchor it above the knee. Promote full extension throughout the joint that is remaining um, so that they don't get stuck into a flex position. So cure the wrap with tape. Do not use those like ace bandage clips. They can um, puncture the patient and cause a wound. For um, upper extremity amputations, we typically use a two to four inch wide wrap. For transtibial, it's usually three or four inches wide. And for transfemoral, it's typically more like six inches wide. So just depending on the size of the limb, that's how you determine which, how um, wide you want the wrap to be. Wrap it frequently and maintain adequate pressure as you move the wrap begins to loosen and slide down and move and it's not really uh, doing its job <laughs> thank you someone that example was good. that's funny um okay so that was amputations now we're going to move on to prosthetics and orthotics and kind of talk about some of the devices you'll see. So an orthosis is, orthosis, sorry, orthosis. Um, it's just an external appliance worn to restrict or assist movement or to transfer load from one area of the body to another. The goals are to provide support, to increase function, to correct deformities, and to redistribute pressure. With an orthotic, uh, orthotic is an adjective and it's used to describe an orthosis, but oftentimes you'll hear the words used interchangeably and a lot of people will use orthotic to describe the actual um, um, device that's being used rather than orthosis, which would be more accurate, but it really is okay to interchange those somewhat. Orthotist is the healthcare provider who designs, fabricates, and fits the orthosis. And then some PTs are trained in um, this type of procedure. When I was um, a tech, the PT I worked with made custom-made um, orthotic devices, but uh, it's kind of rare to come across one unless that's all they're doing. You know, uh, he treated patients and made orth orthosis, but um, most of the time now, there is a guy that only specializes that that isn't necessarily a therapist that will come to 
Um, there's some that have traveling clinics drive around and come to the patient, and then some that have their own uh, stable practice that people need to come to them. Different types. These are all kinds of different types of orthoses, and we're going to go through them throughout the lecture. This is kind of a roadmap of what all we will look at. With a foot orthosis, um, it's like an orthotic insert it's, or insole, uh, what a lot of people call those. It can be semi-rigid, it can be rigid, it can be inserted inside of a shoe and it helps uh, increase the correct foot alignment and increase function. So it adds support and corrects the alignment. It can be custom made or store bought and they typically slide in where the thin cushion is taken out. So the little cushion that's already in the shoe is taken out and this slides in in its place. It's typically thicker so you got to make sure the shoes are wide enough. Um, and I know when I was in pediatrics we would often tell the parents to get um, extra wide shoes and there's sometimes certain brands we would even suggest that typically carry more wide shoes because um, otherwise sometimes their their typical shoe would not fit any longer if they slid the orthosis in there. An AFO or ankle foot orthosis, uh, it can be metal, it could be plastic, and it acts as a mechanical ankle joint. It can be set to allow dorsiflexion or set to limit movement, um, and it just would depend on the patient's needs. So if they're very unstable and need more stability, then typically it's more rigid and does not allow any, any motion at the ankle joint. If they just need assistance with dorsiflexion, but they can um, you know, walk and control some of the movements in the leg, then it may have uh, a joint right there that articulates that bends with the patient. Um, it could also do a dorsiflexion assist where it allows the more dorsiflexion movement um, or limit anterior and posterior movement altogether. Um, it's often seen in patients who have foot drop, who have weak anterior tibialis and their foot is dragging and this could help keep them um, from dragging their foot and tripping over their foot. KAFO, knee ankle foot orthosis. So this typically will provide support and stability at the knee and ankle. Um, it's often used to prevent the knee from bucking, buckling forward and can be used to prevent extension or to provide general stability. So if the patient has significant weakness, could be used to kind of help stabilize the leg and keep them from buckling. Um, or to like lock them out in extension to increase the extension motion. A Craig Scott knee ankle foot orthosis. This is typically um, designed and used for people who have paraplegia, so bilateral lower extremity um, paralysis. And they use hip extension or a posterior trunk lean in order to stand using the brace. So as they lean their trunk back, the brace locks out, locks out and keeps their legs kind of in an extended position and then they're able to swing their legs forward so that they have some functional gait um, with the orthosis arm. HKAFO, so hip, knee, ankle, foot orthosis. Uh, it could be for someone with hip, knee, ankle, and foot weakness, maybe with post-polio syndrome or a stroke that has significant weakness throughout the entire leg. It could also be worn after a hip surgery just to stabilize the joint. Um, I had a patient that I was working with that had some type of a disorder where all of her joints were like significantly lax, and so her hip would dislocate all the time, and she had a surgery to correct it, but had to wear one of these braces. It looks similar to this in this uh, very left picture. Had to wear that for um, like nine months just to make sure that it healed properly. Reciprocating gait orthosis. Oh, I'm sorry. Reciprocating gait orthosis. I need to move the words up so we can see them. Sorry about that.
Okay. Um, it also goes from the hip down. It's a cable system that allows for um, advancement of the lower extremities. So when you shift your weight to one side and tilt your pelvic pelvis by extending your upper back, then uh, and press on the crutches, then that leg that you're leaning away from will um, swing forward. It's allowed to advance in that way. So as you shift your weight off that leg, that leg advances. And then when you shift the weight onto the other leg and also uh, tuck the pelvis, extend the trunk, it will advance as well. So it's a way of allowing someone to get reciprocating gait um, even if they don't have the strength in their legs to do it. Parapodiums, we've talked about standers before. It's a standing frame. Typically, it allows them to stand and to sit. Uh, increases their functional mobility. It increases their tolerance to standing. Helps their bones reabsorb calcium. All those benefits to standing. But for someone who has significant weakness and is not able to stand otherwise. All right, now we're moving up to the trunk. So some of the trunk orthosis um, can be rigid, they can be flexible. So usually if it's a surgery or something, it'll be more rigid. If it's just to support the low back for pain, it will be more flexible. Um, it can be used with people who have scoliosis or recent back surgery or some type of instability. It is used to limit spinal motion, especially a very stable orthosis um, and help them maintain their precautions after a surgery as well. With the corset, this provides compression and stability to support the abdominal, so it could be used after an abdominal surgery or after childbearing or something like that to help kind of provide some external support. You have to be real careful with any brace, any orthosis that uh, you don't overuse, so it's good to have that extra stability, but then you want to start strengthening those areas and kind of wean yourself off of them when possible. Um, certain conditions, it might not ever be possible, but with a lot of conditions, you'll be able to eventually go to where you're strengthening the muscles and wearing the brace less and less so that you're relying on your own muscle strength. But if you wear something like this all the time, your, your abdominal muscles will actually get weaker and weaker over time, which creates more of a problem when you take it off. So you have to just find that balance of still strengthening but using that for extra support. A Milwaukee back brace, this is for uh, scoliosis. It's also called a CTLSO or cervicothoracolumbosacral orthosis. Say that three times fast. Cervicothoracolumbosacral orthosis. <laughs> used to promote spine realignment in people with severe scoliosis. It's often used in the children um, and trying to get them in a good position as their spine is growing. And that is the Milwaukee back brace. A Taylor brace just limits trunk flexion and extension. It has a three-point control system at the shoulders and the back and the trunk and uh, can help kind of support the area and give you cues for uh, upright for a better posture alignment. Cervical orthoses, there's all kinds of various cervical orthoses. Again, this one is the Milwaukee, so it's um, could have went on the other slide, but um, they can be soft, they can be rigid, they can be a halo where they have actually uh, connected the device to your skull so that you can, you have no movement whatsoever, just depending on the condition. So if the, the person is um, has an unstable um, fracture of the spine, meaning that if it moves, it could uh, possibly push into the spinal cord and cause a spinal cord injury, then a halo or something extreme would be more um, appropriate for that patient. Offloading braces, these can be used for people with diabetes or with charcoal foot with pressure ulcers on their foot where they want to still walk, but they don't need to weight bear through the foot. So it offloads an area, typically it's the entire foot, 
um, to allow for healing. So in all these braces, the uh, loading, the pressure is through the um, upper part of the lower leg rather than the foot, and the foot is just hanging within. I've seen a guy um, that had shoes that were like this, and the shoe itself looked pretty thick, um, but it was really cool the way he was walking and able to still walk. He had charcoal foot really bad um, and able to walk without putting pressure on his foot. All right, why do we use orthoses? So we want to stabilize an area, to correct alignment, to take pressure off of an area, to allow for healing. Again, when something's healing and you're adding pressure to the area, it pushes the blood out of the area and will not promote healing. So to allow that, to prevent injuries or deformities, to increase mobility, to assist weak muscles, and to inhibit tone. All right, to prescribe the correct device, things that they look at is static versus dynamic. Do we just need them to be able to stand with some stability or do we need to, them to be able to move? Uh, do I want a orthosis that allows them to run or that just keeps them from falling in a standing position? Is this gonna be a temporary fix or a permanent life change? Um, how much support is really required, how much weakness is there, is that the energy efficiency, if you look at some of the prosthetic legs for an older guy who um, had complications from diabetes versus a um, young person who was in a motor vehicle accident and now is a um, an athlete and running with it, it's going to be completely different um, based on their needs cosmetic appearance and cost. So depending on what the patient's needs are, we would decide the best orthosis for them. I have a picture of Power Step on here. This is an over-the-counter um, orthosis that I personally have used and um, I've heard of um, several foot doctors um, recommend these. Um, so if it's something that you feel like you need some extra support, maybe you're having plantar fasciitis or something, that could be some, one that you look into. They have all kinds of different ones depending on what you're using it for, but um, I personally have used it and had good results with that one. So I had it on here just to remind uh, myself to uh, mention that if you're looking for a cheaper alternative because those may be around $60 or so, but the custom-made ones are typically around $200. And the, Sometimes insurance will pay, but not not all, all the time. All right, so prosthetics. We covered orthotics, now prosthetics. It's a device that's used in place of an absent part of the body. So with an orthotic, it is enhancing the stability and the use of a part of the body that's there. With a prosthetic, it's in place of a part of the body that is no longer there. Um, it includes prosthetics that we automatically think of for the leg, arm, all that, but it also includes dentures, heart valves, um, any other uh, device that is foreign to the body that is put in place of a body part. A prosthetist is the medical professional who designs, fabricates, and fits prosthetic devices. With a transtibial prosthesis, um, this is used with patients who have the tibia and fibula transcendent. So they have had the baloney amputation or the transtibial amputation. And it, of course, used to be called baloney amputation. <laughs> but they would need a pro transtibial prosthesis. Transfemoral prosthesis for someone with an above knee amputation or a transfemoral amputation. And you can see just from these pictures how widely they vary. I mean, each one of these looks completely different. Um, osteointegration for transfemoral amputation. This is where they drive a metal pole into the femur and it hangs out the bottom of the residual limb and that in itself connects directly to a prosthetic device so that they're able to walk using that. Um, it's a surgical cool procedure. It could be risky, especially for someone who um, 
doesn't have real good bone health because the bone could shatter. Um, and, but it is, and also the, the other thing is sometimes it's hard to heal um, the very bottom portion right around the metal portion because um, there's a foreign object right there. So it's really hard for the skin to fully heal. A lot of times they weep around the area and they um, get infected and stuff. So you have to be really careful about that. But um, the convenience of it, of being able to just snap the um, prosthetic device in and not have to worry about proper fit of the um, garments in between and all that type of stuff um, may be more beneficial for some people. All right, prosthetic checkout. So you assess um, a prosthesis or an orthosis and you determine if it's fitting properly, if there's any complications related to the device and if any more changes need to be made to the device. That's called a prosthetic checkout. Typically it's done by the um, prosthetist and uh, the PT may be involved slightly, but typically not um, a great deal. There are, of course, other prosthetic devices for arms and hands and all types of things. But again, I just want you to know just enough to um, understand what's going on. And if this is something you're interested in, um, I would highly recommend taking more courses to learn more about um, amputations and prosthetic and orthotics. Let me know if you have questions. See you in lab.